Welcome to Christ Online. We're going to talk about power and how good it is to be king. Or at least how good it is to be King Saul. And the power that he had over David, or did he? Who do you know that has power? Do they wield it over others? We're going to talk about how you give up power for the sake of the other. We're glad you're here on Christ Online. Welcome. Good to see all of you on this first Sunday of Advent. The church looked beautiful. Um, thank you to those who uh, made a point to come out and help decorate on Friday and deck the halls for um, this special season of, of Advent. Um, hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and we're glad that on a, a busy weekend of travel and um, preparing for uh, Christmas that you are here to worship Christ today. Um, just want to lift up a couple things. Um, Many of you have heard by now that the Christmas Eve worship schedule has been changed slightly. The first service will be at 3 p.m. 
instead of 4 p.m. The rest of the services are still at the normal time, but if that was your service, the 4 p.m. this year, it's an hour ahead of time, 3 p.m. So just want to make sure that's on everybody's radar screen. Um, after worship today, we have a baptism class out in the parlor. So if you're interested in learning more, adult or child, about the um, sacrament of baptism, come join us. We'll share more with you. And then lastly, check out the back of your bulletin. We have uh, a lot of wonderful programs, concerts, gatherings coming up here at uh, Christ Lutheran this December. A lot of time and uh, energy has gone into preparing these. Um, So we hope you'll come and celebrate with us uh, the next few weeks. Let's stand and begin our worship together. first Sunday of Advent, we give thanks for the desire of all the nations who will come and will bring peace and hope 
to all and who calls us now to keep watch, to stay awake, for we know not the hour in which he comes. So we light the candle praying, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Have you seen the new movie out about Mr. Rogers, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood? I read this past week an article from Newsweek. I haven't seen the film yet, but I saw where it said, you know, after 15 years of him um, no longer being with us, there's been this resurgence of talking about Mr. Rogers because we're hungry for his kindness. We're hungry for his calm, for his gentleness. And one thing I always loved and I so much appreciated about him um, was that when he talked about things, even to little kids, he did it with a lot of depth. And when he talked about love, for example, it wasn't just, oh, just love. He acknowledged that it's hard sometimes. It's hard and difficult work. In fact, I saw this quote by him. He said, love isn't a state of perfect caring. Love is an active noun like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and right now. Sounds like uh, something a pastor might say, which he was. And it's been really powerful to hear how people have discovered that. A Presbyterian pastor who was not only caring for kids, but who was teaching them how to follow the loving way of Jesus Christ. Let's say our confession together. Loving God. If you waited until we were perfect to love us, you would still be waiting. But you came down to earth and found us when we were lost. Before we loved you, you accepted and loved us first. Why do we turn away from loving and accepting others? Forgive us for adding to the division and pain in our world. Be with us in the struggle to love. Show us that we are cherished by you and make us bold to cherish others this Advent season. Amen. Paul writes in Romans, But God proves his love for us in this, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I announce the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share God's peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Who can compare with you in majesty? Who is like you, Lord, in your authority? You are every.
Let us pray. No one is like you, O oh God. Your ways are not our ways. We pray, though, that you would make us more like you, that you'd grant us the ability to see with your worldview. Lord, that your kingdom would be what wakes us up and lays us down at night. And that you'd shape us by your Holy Spirit to know the power of your love that lives in us. In the name of Jesus, the coming one, we pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated. This time we welcome our children, five and under, to join Miss Kristen in the back for the children's sermon. <clears throat> and as they're making their way out, if I could invite you to take a look at the um, insert for Stephen Ministry in your bulletin. This is a, um, an incredible ministry of compassion uh, that we have at our church and many other churches around the country. Um, and I want to share with you a video about what Stephen Ministry is and how it, might, um, how it might touch your life. Let's take a look. It's been almost exactly 10 years since my wife hurt herself on the job the first time, which led to uh, a whole bunch of things. Kay's situation has gone from oops to uh-oh to oh my God to holy. And it's still there. I mean, she still can't walk from the original surgery. She's wheelchair bound, doesn't get out very much, is on dialysis now because her kidneys failed. And I've been the guy who's been there all that time. And I was just putting so much pressure on myself. And so finally, one of the guys, a good buddy, called me at home and he said, we are going to get you a Stephen minister. He knew all that story. And he said, we're going to get you a Stephen minister. And I said, well, it's time. It's time. My Stephen minister is just a little bit older than I. And sometimes when, when we're together, I, I have to say it even to him, you know, we're just like two old parts sitting around drinking coffee on a Wednesday morning. It's just so easy to be with him. He, he's just so tuned in to what I'm doing that he knows the right questions. He never suggests anything. He's not there to, he's not there to tell me what to do. He's there to get me to talk to myself until I discover what is necessary. And I can tell him anything. He listens to anything. He listens to the good stuff. He listens to the bad stuff. And he's also very happy about the successes that I've had along the way. I can't wait to tell him about some things. So it's, it's been a lot of pressure. But my Stephen minister has just walked me through it, talked me through it, questioned me through it. This, this relationship with the Stephen minister is about you and God and, and getting you through the next period. And I'm very proud to say I have a Stephen minister. If you're under anything like the pressure that I was under then, wouldn't you like to be where I am now? You can, you can get there if you take on a Stephen minister. But you can't have the one that I have. The name Stephen Ministry comes from the um, man Stephen in the book of Acts, who uh, was willing to serve tables, uh, was a deacon in the church. Um, so these are people in our church who are trained to walk alongside others like Stephen did in the book of Acts, showing um, that faithfulness, that tenderness. I sh we share it today for two reasons. Number one is if you or somebody in your life could benefit from having a Stephen minister, Please let one of the people on the handout or any of the pastors know. Um, they don't have to be a church member. If it's a friend or someone that's outside of this community as a member, they can still receive one. Um, secondly is in January, we'll have a training for a new group of Stephen ministers. So if you might have uh, some of the gifts, if you're not sure if you might have some of the gifts, you can come and check it out and see if it might be a good fit. Uh, so stay tuned for um, that coming up in January. Thanks for listening. All right, sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue this journey this fall through the Old Testament, and we're coming down the home stretch of this 
um, period of the CBE, the Community Bible Experience. It started with Genesis, and now we've made our way up into 1 Samuel. Um, that'll take us right up to 2 Kings at Christmas time. And uh, pray that if, if even if you're behind in the reading, that you still uh, um, know that you're part of this journey. And I hope the messages have helped to help us to see the bigness of this story. You know, how God's forming this people after his own heart, leading up to today when he chooses um, these kings, these, the beginning of the royal uh, leaders. So 1 Samuel 24 today is where we'll spend most of our time, but we're also going to look at one of the classic Scriptures for Advent, Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. So if you have, if you have your Bible and um, I want to open that to 1 Samuel 24, we'll be there first. Once there was a man who, a few weeks before Christmas, was brought to stand trial before a judge. And the judge said to him, Sir, what are your charges? What are you being accused of? And he said, Well, Your Honor, I, I was caught doing my Christmas shopping very early. And the judge said, that doesn't sound like a problem to me. I wish I could do that. He said, what do you mean by very early, though? He said, well, Your Honor, it was, um, uh, it was before the shop was open. Uh, <laughs> the Advent season, which begins today, is a, it's a season of hope-filled waiting. A waiting not just for the shops to open, although we should, so we can snag the best deals and get the Christmas shopping done on time, awaiting not even for the celebration of Christmas primarily with all the special traditions that it brings. Chris, or Advent, rather, is a time of hope awaiting for Jesus to come back, to reset the world back in tune with the will and the ways of God, the ways of love, hope, joy, peace, which the four Sundays of Advent typically represent. We've called this sermon series for Advent this year, Reset and Reign. You know, given what a high-tech world we live in, aren't you grateful for a reset button every now and then? When's the last time you used one? I was out uh, earlier this week, I was um, making dinner, which I, I can't claim to do as often as I would like to, but that night I was, and I had my phone out. And in a matter of moments, I used this phone to check the weather, play some music, take a picture of something my two sons were doing, um, respond to some text messages, follow the online recipe that I was tracking with, and my phone finally said, I'm done. You're, You're asking too much of me. And it froze. But, you know, with the push and a hold of a few buttons... It was able to, I was able to reboot it, to restart it, to take it back, and it worked fine. Don't you wish sometimes you had one of those for life? When you look around and you see the conflict and the division that surrounds us, the lack of kindness, when you see the massive issues of poverty and hunger and homelessness and all the isms, don't you wish you had a reset button sometimes we could push that would just take us back to the way that God envisioned it being? I do. Recently, a friend of mine recommended a book to me. It's by a guy named Dr. Arthur Brooks. He's a social scientist who teaches at Harvard Business School. And the name of the book is Love Your Enemies. And the subtitle is How Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt. In his research, he found that 93% of Americans dislike how divided we become as a country. His research also found that one out of six Americans is no longer speaking with a friend or a family member because of a disagreement that we've had. He found that there's higher levels of stress and anxiety, but also that we're more likely to view the people who disagree with us as bad people, or in a word with contempt. And he found that a question a lot of people are asking is, when? When are the people who have the power going to bring about change? When are the people who have the, um, the status or the financial resources, the political sway, the movers and the shakers, so to speak, when are they going to bring about the change for the rest of us? To which the Bible says repeatedly, maybe we need to rethink our notion of where power really lies. Because so often... The power 
that came into the earth, under this planet, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, it shows up in the most surprising places. In the people who do the right thing when nobody's looking. Who dare, instead of hating, to love. Somebody like David. Last Sunday, we heard the story of what's often considered David's finest hour. When David goes up against the, Goli- the giant Goliath. And we heard how as this young shepherd boy armed with nothing but how many smooth stones? Five. And his trust in God. David brings down this giant in front of the whole army of Israel. And he's praised as a hero because of that. And it's a valiant victory. But that's not David's finest hour, I don't think. I think his finest hour is found in 1 Samuel 24. Not long after the incident with Goliath, David finds himself facing another giant. Remember how Pastor Scott said last week, that's not going to be the only one. But this is not one of Goliath's brothers with the six fingers and the six toes. This is another giant, one closer to home. It's his own king. What's his name? Saul. Saul, the one that David has served faithfully, has obeyed readily, who has he's been over backwards to try to accommodate, to help Saul. He's played the, the harp when Saul's been troubled. He's done everything to try to assist him. And yet, we, we're told that the more successful David becomes, the more envious and jealous and angry Saul becomes toward David. So much so that he wants to capture David and end his life. And so 1 Samuel 24 starts out with David on the run, along with 600 soldiers that he has with him, which is minuscule compared to the thousands and thousands that Saul has. And there's Saul chasing him, the one with all the visible power. And in terms of resources, David's outmatched, he's outgunned, he's he's um, outmaneuvered in every way, except he's got one thing. David's got a promise. God has said to him, I'm going to keep you safe. I'm going to make something of your life. I'm I'm going to raise you up. By this point, David's already been anointed king by Samuel. He's just not publicly been made king. And he's got this promise that God is going to do it. But it sure doesn't look like things are pointed in that direction at this point in the story. In fact, he's hiding in this part of Israel called the En Gedi, which meant the spring of the young goat. And there's still a lot of goats that live there as well as hundreds of these little caves that are, that are all over. And David and his men are hiding in one of these caves from Saul. And this has become Saul's consuming focus. So much so that he's neglected what his job was to do, which was to run the country. The Philistines have come over and attacked. And they're having to say, Saul, you've got to go back and fix this. But he's so focused on capturing David. And then literally... This other giant walks right into David's hands when Saul, when, there, when Saul comes into this cave. The text says this. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Is this a coincidence? Out of these hundreds of caves that... The one David and his men are hiding in, that's the one Saul chooses to go into all by himself. I don't think so. There's no taunting back and forth between David and Saul. Saul doesn't even realize he's there. But don't be mistaken, this is a battlefield. And David has a choice. With one strike, he could have brought Saul's life to an end. And very few people, certainly of his 600 closest followers there would have faulted him. I mean, this was the guy who for no reason was uh, oppressing him, who was bullying him, who was beating him up, who was doing everything he could to try to come after him. But he doesn't. Instead it says, this is what David does. David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. So there in the darkness, David creeps up and cuts off the robe And you wonder, well, how did he do that? You know, well, maybe he had taken it off and he had set it aside, or maybe the noise of all the soldiers that were outside the cave was loud enough that Saul didn't hear David, but he gets close enough and he cuts off the robe. But this is not just any robe. 
This is the royal robe. It's a priestly, royal kind of robe. It's got great significance and symbolic power. And we're told that David, even after he does this, he's conscience-stricken because it's an insult. Now, he's not going to cut off Saul's head the way he had Goliath, but he's cut off his robe. He's still thrown a, a jab in there. He's still done something to insult him, to, to prick him, to bring him down. And David, his conscience, this guy that God has given to us, it's been so formed in him by prayer, by walking with God, that even this, what seems like a small act by comparison, it's enough to shake his conscience to the core. So much so that he, um, he's going to tell his men that uh, you guys got to back off. Because he's, he's being called to stay, to wait, to wait for God to act. What that represented was David's impatience. I'm going to at least do a little something when, rather than just trust fully that God is going to protect me and that God's going to raise me up. I think there's that element to it. But there's another piece too. The text goes on and says, With these words, David rebuked his men, did not allow them to attack Saul. Saul left the cave and went on his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord, the king, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. There's another piece that the, of course, the piece of the robe serves. That after Saul goes back out and he's leaving with no clue that David's been there, he runs out after him and cries out at great risk to himself, look what I've done. I could have struck you down, but in love I didn't. And the amazing thing is, not returning violence for violence, but returning love for hate and violence, that's what cracks Saul's shell. That's what pierces his heart. So that Saul weeps, says, David, is that you? I've treated you poorly, but you've treated me well. You know, every year in the spring, we ask our confirmation students to choose their favorite Bible verse or story. And almost without fail, the top three, well, in the top three are David and Goliath, which makes sense. It's an incredible story. It's got all the drama, the young David's facing Goliath, he brings him down. You know, like Pastor Scott said last week, it's about how to overcome obstacles, and it's an awesome story, but it's, it's, it can't hold a candle to what David does here, I think, because this is a greater strength. It's the power of love, that David, he exhibits that restraint, that trust in God to take care of him rather than return to Saul what he's received. Martin Luther King Jr. used to talk about this a lot. In one of the most famous passages he ever wrote about it, he said this, Through violence you may murder the hater, but you do not murder the hate. In fact, the violence merely increases the hate. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. You know, in the divisions that we experience, the easy thing to do would be to show contempt for contempt, hate for hate. The easy thing to do would be to dismiss those who disagree with us as just bad people or just evil people, whatever word you want to use to show that contempt. The easy thing to do, too, would be to act as if we don't have power to make a difference. The harder thing to do would be to pray, Lord, let your light and your love show me how to use the power that you've given to me to bring people together, to unite, to pull. So often Jesus stood with the people who um, the world considered powerless, not just to console them, not just to comfort them, although that was part of it, but to remind them that you have power too. You have the power to be agents of healing. You have the power to unite and bring, bring people together in kinship and in love. You have that power in you. In this Advent season, it's a time of waiting, yes, but it's an active waiting as we use that power. The question is, how will you use it? 
So often this power it shows up in surprising places, I think. Two houses over from where my wife Megan and our two sons, where we live, there's a family that has eight children and their ninth is due in January. Mom's from Sweden, dad's from Bermuda. They moved to Charlotte so that the dad could work at a Christian school. They're an awesome family. Um, One day, these kids were out in our front yard along with a bunch of other neighborhood kids. And I noticed out of the corner of my eyes, I was working over toward the garage. One of the bigger kids shoved one of the little ones down as they were fighting over who could go on this tree swing. And this little kid, he gets up and he's bristling. And I'm wondering, what's going to happen now? Am I going to need to step in here? And I, I hear out of the corner of my, uh, out of my, here from my, just faintly over there, the nine-year-old from this family of 11, his name's Ezra. And I think, that can't be right. But sure enough, he's quoting from Paul's letter to the Romans. <laughs> Nine years old, and he's saying to this little mud-stained kid, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, that ended it. <laughs> and, I, and it just brought this peace. Now, I'm not sure how much that little mud-stained kid understood that verse, but something connected with them because they got along with playing again. And I thought, wow, what power. What power. There was a famous astronomist, Carl Sagan, who taught at Cornell. He was a critic of Christianity. He said, the Christian hope that Jesus will come again, that's like believing the cow will jump over the moon. In other words, he said, that's just silly. And you have to admit, sometimes when you look around at the division and the conflict and the hatred, and you think about that love's going to overcome that, it does seem maybe a little silly a little far-fetched. The fact that Jesus will come again, who lived and walked on this earth 2,000 years ago, that he's going to come back. Some might say that is a crazy idea, except we have one thing. And it's the same thing David had in the cave, in the darkness. It's the promise. It's the promise that Jesus said, I will come back. I will return. I will reset the world. I will renew the world and make all things new the way God meant for it to be. And in the meantime, whether you're nine years old or you're 99 years old, you have power to be a sign of that kingdom breaking in today. The question is, how are you going to use it? Will you use it? In Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, Luke list all the most powerful figures of Jesus' day. He says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was the governor, and he lists other people, Herod and Philip and Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest, when all these big movers and shakers were in their positions, the word of God came down, but it didn't come to any of them. Instead, it came to this obscure, ordinary guy by the name of John who's out in a wilderness. And John's message essentially is one of resetting. That when the Messiah comes, the mountains will be brought low, the valleys lifted up, the crooked ways will be made straight. And you see John with this amazing power at work as he's gathering all these people there at the Jordan River. And he doesn't use it to crush his enemies. Rather, he he uses it to say that whether you're rich or poor, you're Gentile or Jew, you belong. You're equally in need of grace. Come and be baptized in these waters. In those days, baptism was primarily a ceremony for Gentiles who wanted to become Jewish. And so for a Jewish person to be baptized, it was like saying i got to start over. I have to start from the beginning. I am no better than the Gentile who knows nothing of how to do this faith thing. I'm starting fresh. And John says, that's where we're going to begin. And then people notice, boy, this John guy's pretty good. You know, man, wow. He, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one we've been waiting for. And John says, no. One who's coming after me I'm not even going to be worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. Why does he say that? In those days, if you were a student of a rabbi, the rabbi could ask you to do a lot of things. Go get the water, fill up the coffee cup. 
whatever it is. But they weren't supposed to ask you to untie the thong of their sandals. Because that was considered too humiliating, too lowly of a task, even for the most basic entry-level disciple to do. And John says, I'm not even going to be worthy to do that for this person. Which is amazing. Because when Jesus is born, the one who's the most powerful person who's ever lived and ever will live, he doesn't ask his disciples to untie his sandals. Rather, he stoops down and washes their feet in servanthood. When Jesus, the son of David, the heir to King David's throne, comes, he does bring low the proud and raise up the lowly. But at the same time, he welcomes everyone to share a place at his table of grace. When Jesus, the one who has power and dominion over the whole cosmos, over the universe, when he's born, he doesn't come down to crush his enemies, to get even, but to pour himself out in love to the point of dying on a cross. Why does he do it? Because he trusts in God. Because he knows that only light can drive out the darkness, that only love can overcome hate, and most of all, because he loves you, and he loves me. And he says over and over again, that same power, that same love can live in you. It does live in you. And you don't have to buy it, or earn it, or beg for it, and you certainly don't have to break in a store early to steal it. Because it's a free gift through the working and the presence of God's Holy Spirit that's given to us. The question is now, what will you do with it? How will you use that power that you have, that I have, to heal, to show compassion, tenderness? Not waiting for the cow to jump over the moon, but waiting instead, not letting ourselves be overcome with evil, but striving, praying, Lord, every day as you come, help us to overcome the evil with good. Thanks be to God. Amen.
we will give him honor and we will give him the praise. He will come in peace. He will come in power. And he will come to save Oh, yes, he will. We will give him glory. stand as you're able, as together we say our confess, our confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we continue with our offering.
Let us approach our God in prayer. Emmanuel, God who lives with us and within us, come, we pray. Come in your power, a power that serves, a power that gives selflessly, that is poured out endlessly for us. Come and free us so that we can be your Advent people, waiting daily for you and that our lives would be a sign of your kingdom that is coming on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, reset our love in the ways that you know each of us needs. Come, Emmanuel, to whom we give thanks. As our nation raises grateful songs and praises to you, O Lord, this weekend, open our eyes to recognize all the variety of your gifts more fully. Lord, most of all, help us to see the gifts in each other and in our neighbors of every ethnicity, nation, and culture. Lord, watch over, watch over all who travel back home from Thanksgiving celebrations today. Come, Emmanuel, Prince of Peace. Lord, where our world cries out for safety and comfort amidst violence, be present. Lord, we pray for those in London, England, following the attack in the city this past week. 
for our city where lives continue to be lost violently, for all places that are in need. Lord, bring low mountains of contempt. Lord, raise up the lowly caught in fear. Let your goodness overwhelm the evil. Be near us, Emmanuel, God, this Advent. And in our watchful waiting, Lord, help us to listen to your voice. In the glitter of decorations and gatherings, open us to see you in ordinary places. And in the faces of the hungry, the sick, the lonely. Use this Advent to reset and reign in us, O God, as you work through your holy word. Father, we pray that you'd stir up your power of healing and come for all those on our prayer list as we lift up John's daughter, Marie, and Pat, Carol, Mona. We pray for, pray for Dick and for Catherine, for Jean and for Don, for Nate, for Dana, for Shirley, for all those who grieve, O oh God. And hear the names of others that we lift up to you in silence or aloud. Continue to pour out your peace upon Renee and her family on the death of Eric. And now, Lord, bless your church, your gathered people, so that our concerts, our Christmas programs, our gatherings this December, Lord, let them tell the story of your power that's made perfect in weakness. Lord, let us proclaim your boundless love for all your people. All this and whatever else you see that we need, we pray now in the holy, strong name of Jesus. Amen. Now may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen.
Amen. Amen. It's, a, it's uh, just a reminder, the first Sunday of the month, so we'll have our prayer partners. If you would um, uh, like to have some additional prayer, they'll be up here at the kneeling rails. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glad you're here on Christ Online. Have you thought about your throne, about where your seat of power is? But more importantly, ask yourself this week, how can I give up my power for the sake of the other? Thanks for joining us here at Worship on Christ Online.